Hey there, subscribe to my channel, and also press this bell icon so you never miss any new updates cause whenever we upload new video you will get a notification on your phone. The test is in 4 part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well, I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3. Right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mr... The answer is level 3 or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Pettersen. John Pettersen. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Pettersen? P E double T E R double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear. Does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Pettersen. The maximum class size is 12, but I've never known there to be more than 9 or 10 in a class. It could even be 5 or 6. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day. Two hours only on Saturday. Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Pettersen. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus, or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the 1st of June in Hamburg and a week later in Berlin, which is what would concern you as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the 8th of June. The next course would begin on the 2nd of July and then... The 2nd of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr Pettersen. Can I have your address, please? 26 Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr Pettersen. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing. But you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheid, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary, not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a member of the local council describing plans to redevelop part of the seafront of a coastal town. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Listen carefully to the first part of the talk and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good evening, everybody. I wasn't expecting to see so many people. Clearly, this is an issue of great local interest. Thank you all for coming. Well, as you all know, I've come to talk about the council's plans for redeveloping the western part of the seafront. Firstly, of course. The Queen's Parade shopping centre is to be demolished. It was built on the cheap and in a hurry in 1953, and recently came third in a national newspaper's ugliest buildings in the country list. So I don't think anybody's going to miss it. The question was, what do we replace it with? Well, after consultations with the local community, we decided. 
as I'm sure most of you are aware, uh, to replace it with a complex of small shops and workshops, plus a three-screen cinema. We particularly didn't want another bland glass and steel shopping centre full of the same old chain stores as every other town centre. No, this is our chance to do something just a little bit different. I'll start at the top. On the third floor will be a cafe and a restaurant. Part of this will be open air, so people can enjoy a meal or a cup of coffee in the fresh air. Weather permitting, of course. Below this will be the cinema. And below that, on the first floor, will be some much needed council offices. We're getting very cramped in the town hall, I can assure you. On the ground floor will be 20 small shop units, ranging in size from 20 to 50 square metres. Also on the ground floor will be five workshop spaces, which we hope will attract small manufacturing businesses back to the town centre, providing some additional local employment. Underneath the centre will be an underground car park, not a great big car park like in the present centre. Our aim is that most visitors to the centre will come on foot or by bus. In fact, the car park will be restricted to people working in the centre and disabled visitors. Then, and perhaps this is the most exciting part of the project, the beach in front of the new complex is going to be completely transformed. We're going to extend the beach. Yes, extend it. 10,000 tonnes of sand is going to be brought in to make it into a proper beach instead of the dirty little strip of sand it is now. As well as being for the enjoyment of local people, we're hoping that a decent beach will attract more visitors to the town, and that has to be good for local businesses. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now I must emphasise that these plans have not yet been finalised. That's what this meeting is about. Of course, it's vital with a project like this that we have the support of local people. After all, we work for you and it's your money that's paying for it. So, first of all, the plans for the new centre are going to go on display in the Town Hall. They'll be there from Monday the 5th of March until Friday the 6th of April. Uh, plenty of time for anybody who's interested to get over there and have a look at them, I think. There'll be a suggestions box in the same room as the plans. Anybody who has anything to say is welcome to fill in a suggestions form. These forms will be looked at and taken seriously, you can be sure of that. Then on Tuesday, April the 10th, there'll be another public meeting much like this one and in this same place. It'll start at seven o'clock and there'll be a chance for local residents to address the council. We'll also report back to you on the results gathered in the suggestions box. Anyway, I'd now like to hand you over to my colleague, my fellow councillor. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part 3. Part 3. You are going to listen to a radio program about buying a house. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon listeners. Today I'd like to welcome Edward Fox who is going to talk to us today about buying a house. Edward. Thank you Eunice. For most people at least buying a house is a major life event and probably the single most expensive item you are ever likely to buy. It is also a place that you can make your home. Therefore, thinking carefully before you make a purchase is of the utmost importance. One of the most important things to consider before buying any property is the location. Because remember, it is where you plan to spend a large part of your life, or indeed the rest of your life in some circumstances. Therefore, consider the type of life you enjoy leading. Are you a very sociable person? who enjoys nightclubs and discos? If so, then you may wish to consider something close to the city, or indeed in a city where it is convenient for all types of nightlife. On the other hand, if, like me, you prefer a quieter life, then you may want to consider something away from the city. However, do remember that proximity to your place of work is also important. Indeed, we spend most of our life at work, and you don't want to have to spend two or more hours every day travelling to work now, do you? Therefore, transport is the utmost importance. City suburbs, however, are often conveniently located for commuting to work. All for shopping. Without being in the heart of a busy city. You may, however, think that a house in the suburbs would be far too expensive. Yet, houses located in cities can often exceed the price of suburban houses. So check out the prices you may be surprised. Family is another important consideration. You may prefer a house that is away from a busy street or main road. And of course, remember that children have to attend school. Is there a good school in the area? Or would your children have to travel a long distance to get to school? Therefore, if you have children, or you plan to have children, location is a very important factor. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. And of course, remember that a family influences the size of the property. There are, of course, various types of houses. There are detached houses which stand alone and are not joined by to another building. Then there are semi-detached houses, which incidentally are the most common, and for good reason, because they are less expensive than detached houses, this is because they are, in fact, two houses joined together, and therefore take up less space. And finally, there are townhouses, which are many houses joined together to form a long row. But don't think that townhouses are less expensive than semi-detached houses. They rarely are. This is because they are usually built in cities where the prices of property is very expensive indeed. The age of property is another consideration. If you're considering buying an old house, beware. You may be faced with expensive repairs and renovation bills. So have the house thoroughly checked by a professional surveyor before you decide to buy. 
But then again, there are things you can look for yourself. Things such as the condition of the woodwork, especially doors and windows that can be expensive to replace. More importantly, make sure all the fixtures and fittings, things such as cupboards, sinks, taps, bathtubs, are all in good working order, because replacing kitchens and bathrooms can be a very costly business. And don't forget the garden. If the property has one, if you enjoy gardening, then fine. But if you don't enjoy gardening, then you may prefer a small garden as opposed to a big one. But even if you do enjoy gardening, it is important to remember that gardens take up a lot of your time. So keeping a garden in good order may be a very difficult if you work long hours. One final thing is the general feel of the place. Does it have a good atmosphere? And most importantly of all, would you feel comfortable living there? Thank you, Edward. But I'm afraid that's all we have time for today. But I'll be back next Wednesday when my guest speaker will be talking about buying a computer. So until then, bye for now. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecturer talking to students about sport in Ireland. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Now today we're going to be finding out about the most popular sports in the Emerald Isle. That's Ireland, of course. Can you guess what they are? Well, there are these two lesser played games, a form of rounders and Gaelic handball. But we'll start with one which is perhaps over 3,000 years old arriving in Ireland with the Celts, some claim. That may be a slight exaggeration, but I consider it to be the fastest field game in the world, and it goes by the name of hurling. Well, that's what it's known as in the English-speaking world anyway. So, what do you have to do? You've got 15 players on a team, one of them the goalkeeper. Each one has a stick called a hurley. Here you are. I've brought mine along. Had it since I was at school. This is what it looks like, and basically you have to get this ball, called a schlitter, that's S-L-I-O-T-A-R, so it's not spelt the way it's pronounced. You hit it into the net for three points, or you can hit it over the net for one point. The goal looks like the letter H, with the net under the crossbar. The goalie has a bigger stick than the others to help keep the ball out. You can also catch the schlitter and run with it for four steps maximum, or bounce it on your stick. Is that clear to you all? I'll be showing you a video a bit later, so you can see what a game actually looks like. You might like to think of it as a mixture of lacrosse, hockey and baseball. Oh, and it's played by women too but it goes by the name of Komogi in that case. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. I'll give you a bit of the history, shall I now? Generally, the golden age of the game is considered to be the 18th century. But systematic rules were first agreed and drawn up at that great shrine of learning, Trinity College Dublin, in 1879, founding the Irish Hurling Union, closely followed just a few years later by the formation of the Gaelic Athletics Association. With greater organisation last century, the All-Ireland Hurling Championship got off to a flying start, and I'm proud to say that my own native city of Cork has won more than 20 titles over the years. But then, so have Kilkenny and Tipperary. Is it only played in Ireland? No. Well, it is the only country with a national team at the moment, but you may be surprised to discover there are hurling clubs in London, as well as in America and Argentina, to name just a few. The other game I'd like to take a little time to introduce you to is Gaelic football, which is played on the same pitch as hurling with the same number of players. But there's no net. You just have to get the ball over your opponent's goalposts. And you can do that by kicking or punching the ball. However, you're not supposed to do that to the players, I might add. Imagine it as a combination of soccer and basketball. But in my opinion, it's a more exciting spectacle than either of those. Excuse my bias, if you will. It's also very popular with women. In fact, there are more women's teams than for any other sport. Whether despite or because of the physical contact involved, I wouldn't like to say. They do play a shorter game, 60 minutes, rather than the men's 70. So, let's have a look. If we can have the lights down, I'll see if I can get this technology to work. <laughs> 